I was asked during an interview about why mindfulness should be part of a healthy lifestyle change. And I could only answer by saying it was part of mine. I used to think I was bulletproof with how good I felt, the knowledge base I had, and how I was able to problem solve back in my 30s. But what I didn't know was the power of mindfulness and the relaxation response. There are tests that show certain parts of the brain will be stimulated by giving morphine. And those same areas can be stimulated by sex, alcohol, fast food, love, laughing, exercise, family, nature. The good thing is that when we're young, we can sometimes reproduce that feeling and will want it. The brain has this built-in set point for the survival of the species to always give you a reward when you stimulate those parts of the brain. You'll want to feel pleasure. It's part of that motivational triad that Doug Lyle came up with. You know, we'll always seek pleasure in the form of food or sex. Well, it also boils down to other things, as I mentioned. The problem is as you get older and you're exposed to more fast food, more alcohol, maybe some drugs, it will sometimes give you a false sense of security. It'll stimulate those same areas and you'll have that as your usual way to get pleasure or feel good. And the problem would be that if that's the only way you know to feel good, and you're inundated with stressors in life, challenges in life. As you get older, it always happens. Then you'll always go back to those fast rewards to stimulate the same parts of the brain. That's what I thought. And then I was introduced to meditation, mindfulness. I went to a Harvard class that was put on at the Benson Henry Institute by Herb Benson. He came up with the relaxation response. Something that you can turn on with regular practice. If you're an athlete, martial artist, a yoga practitioner, or a Tai Chi enthusiast, you'll know that this can be reproduced on a daily basis. Because you want to experience and get the reward center firing off 12 to 24 hours a day. Unfortunately, alcoholics can sometimes get that same reward center turned on, but they'll have to dive into alcohol and that will cause side effects sooner or later. Liver toxicity, problems with dysfunctioning, uh, social interactions. Now there's no downside with yoga, meditation, Tai Chi. There might be a downside with exercise. It depends. If you, in fact, if you've ever seen during a cold Chicago snowfall, a guy with a headband, uh, undershirt, pair of shorts and sneakers just running in the snow and you look at him as you drive by slipping and sliding wondering what the heck is that guy doing? Well, it's because he's going after that reward center. He's had tracks burned into his brain to say he gets reward from running. That's why the sport of running is so addictive. If you've ever been lucky enough to go to a good yoga class, that's why you want to keep on going to yoga class. Now there's practical reasons why you can't go to yoga class every day. Well, if you practice on your own and are able to stimulate that same reward center, then great. Yoga, Tai Chi, exercise takes time. Mindfulness and a meditation practice, all you need is a pillow, maybe a little bit of guided imagery, and quiet, and that's effortless. The problem I see my patients coming up with is a lot of people that have not been trained will feel very frustrated. And that's okay, it's normal. But if you concentrate on the frustration, then you're not practicing mindfulness, you're practicing frustration. And self-ridicule, and doubt, and it's, that's not healthy either. So sometimes you have to be guided by an instructor on how to do things. Maybe a DVD, maybe an immersion class that goes on for a week to two weeks. That's how I learned. And that was one of the life-changing times for me, is going to the Chopra Center during the Seduction of Spirit conference. And that's when for five to seven days you just are given meditation twice a day, you're given the science of why you meditate, you're with like-minded individuals, you're given great food. It's fantastic. And if you can go away from that still feeling good and practicing on your own for at least 21 to 30 days after you leave, 
usually the brain will burn in this neural tract. I'll explain that this way. Uh, everybody knows when you exercise, you can get bigger muscles. When you exercise or you play a sport, you continue to do that one movement, whether it's a bench press, a squat, or a jump shot, or a foul shot, or a pitch. You keep on practicing and practicing and practicing because the muscle memory gets better. Before you know it, unconsciously you'll throw, you'll shoot, you'll lift without effort. And if it's without effort and has positive gains, you'll want to do it again. The same thing happens with the brain. It's called experience-dependent neuroplasticity. And when you continue to practice, like at the Chopra Center, we're taught or suggested that as you leave on your own, going back home and still feeling good, try to practice 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes at night as far as the breath and meditation that you were taught for the first week. And the 21-day meditations that the Chopra Center offers over the internet, for free by the way, also know that if you practice this same ritual, a neural tract will be developed and strengthened and that's shown on MRI as far as cortical thickening. When you practice it over and over again, same time twice a day for a couple of weeks straight, I say 21 to 30 days. But if you can get past that point, it's an easy summit to achieve and manifest the benefits. The brain will start to say it's easier and easier. You'll become less frustrated. You'll be more focused on the benefits and the breath and or the meditation part then on the frustration I can't do it part just like the exercise as you continue to exercise with or without a trainer you'll find that you can go through the weights faster you'll be able to lift more weights you'll be able to run faster you'll be able to run longer because of co continued practice same thing with that tract of the brain that you keep on reproducing all the time this is where today's science is fantastic we know that with fight or fear there's a little area of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala, which is an almond-shaped area of the brain, is responsible to turn on with fear. And if it does get turned on, it's like an alarm system, it stimulates the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus turns on the adrenal cortex and you produce all these stress hormones. Cortisol, norepinephrine, epinephrine, adrenaline. And you'll probably remember those in fight or flight. Usually you will either fight or flee and then hopefully the stressor is over. The problem we'll find is like in post-traumatic stress disorder sometimes the amygdala will take a little bit longer to reset and the longer it stays stimulated whether the fear a reason is there or not the longer the hypothalamus and the adrenal cortex continue to stimulate and secrete these fight-or-flight hormones. And that's sometimes what is theorized as being why people with post-traumatic stress disorder, even though the stimulus isn't there, they're out of the war, they're out of the bad relationship, they'll still have a reminder of their relationship, and they'll turn on the same exact experience as when they were first exposed. That part of the cortex becomes thickened. Meditation usually will show that the amygdala will reset faster. In studies by Richie Davidson will show that the amygdala resets faster with people who practice some form of mindfulness. And that's why it's so important for our vets coming back from wars to be given this opportunity to practice mindfulness. The easiest way or access for most individuals is yoga. The only problem is sometimes the hybrid yogas that are out there don't necessarily practice mindfulness or breath. They'll focus more on the pose or the flow of the poses and you might dive into and get the reward but it, it, again it's a little different depending on which form of yoga. Ultimately the ancient exercises or the ancient cultures have their ways of doing things but if you don't have that opportunity around you then you will have to rely on a coach of some sort whether it's a live coach, a YouTube coach or a DVD coach but still it'll probably take going through a variety of different coaches to learn what works best for you. There's different forms of mindfulness. I think what Andy Wilde taught me as far as breath is easy. It's also taught by John Kabat-Zinn. 
Uh, there's also loving kindness. There's different ones that are performed by monks, depending on what part of the world you belong to. So it takes a little bit more than just one attempt in saying, I'm frustrated, I can't do it, it's not for me. You have to keep on chipping away at the iceberg. Because what's guaranteed is that if you have some form of disease manifestation, whether it's psychological like depression or post-traumatic stress disorder or anxiety, or it's physical like a cancer or a heart attack, all those things would only benefit from a mindful practice. There's something called the placebo response, there's something called the nocebo response. I think a lot of my colleagues are when they hear about placebo, they'll be dismissive and thinking, well, that's what we were taught as doctors. Placebo doesn't count. It's fake. So go with what works, prescription medicines or surgery. And my content is that the placebo response is responsible for a lot of miracles. I think of several patients in my practice that have demonstrated that the placebo response has worked to not only reverse their disease, but to also find their joy that they had when they were in their 20s. And these are people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. It would be termed a miracle, but I don't think of it that way. I think that if the body is given the true building blocks it needs to fix itself, that every cell in your body will do just that. It might take some time, and I wouldn't wait till you're at death's door. And that's why when I was asked by the interviewer, what can we do for a healthy lifestyle change, and why do we have to have mindfulness in there? I think that we're missing that. A lot of Americans, especially my guys, are not taught about mindfulness, are not taught about eating properly, uh, have a skewed vision of what you're supposed to do as far as activity. So if you aren't taught, how are you supposed to learn when you just are given a piece of paper from the doctor saying, please try to work on stress? That, that is not an answer. I think that patients are on their own and that's spooky. So that's why it's important to understand this science concept. And there's a lot of science out there nowadays. Just have to kind of put it together and see how it practically applies. But regardless, when mindfulness is put into the healthy lifestyle formula, I think it supports maintaining a whole food, mostly plant-based diet. It also supports maintaining and experimenting with an exercise routine. In a lot of studies, going back to the way the brain develops, Meditation has been shown within four months to change the way the brain looks like on an MRI. That's cortical thickness. So those tracks I talked about with neuroplasticity, it does not matter what age you are, the brain can still continue developing. When those tracks were remeasured in the meditators, after four months it showed thicker tracks within the brain, more brain tissue. And th there is no medicine that will do that. Again, when you go back to the analogy of muscle and working with muscle and being real good and diligent and knowing and seeing the results of muscle getting bigger and easier lifting, you can do that with the brain too, but it takes practice. So that's why I usually say when you're going to start out with one of my breath exercise meditations, try it for about three weeks to four weeks so that it becomes a habit. Again, neuroplasticity and then try to make your changes for healthy lifestyle to also include nutrition and exercise for about four months. Usually at the four month mark, most people can see that as a tangible endpoint and a summit. And again, in, with what shows up on the MRIs of new meditators being given good guidance, yes, you will de develop more brain tissue. So if you can maintain it, you can see it, you can feel it, then the likelihood is you'll be able to sustain it. With all the distractions that we have in daily life, whether they're little stressors or just distractions throughout the day, the brain gets a lot of noise. It's supposed to process all this stuff, everything that's going on around you, all at the same time. The scientific proof of meditation and its benefit are in the form of something that Richie Davidson calls gamma oscillations. He found that there's actually a high frequency response that meditators go through in the frontal cortex, that's the front of the brain, that non-meditators don't go through. He talks about this phase lock that you can go through if you continue practicing meditation. With all the noise that you'll have in a brain, if you have a really set meditation practice, you'll have a dominant amount of gamma oscillations, 
When you have gamma oscillations always occurring throughout the frontal cortex of the brain, if other noise from your distractions throughout the day come in, the noise actually also matches the gamma oscillation so the noise does not become a bothersome problem. If you have no practice and you get hit by wave after wave of distraction then you'll have all of these waves and distorted thinking, you'll have a lot of frustration because the brain's trying to process all this stuff and then with frustration it processes it poorly because when you let background noise become louder in this mishmash of electricity that's bouncing around the brain while you're trying to take on more tasks do more things, problem solve it just becomes very frustrating. And with that, again, the stress response is turned on. You can see this bad cycle of events. When all I ask is just to indulge me in some form of practice so that you get that gamma oscillation going, so that you become bulletproof to all the other things that are becoming your way. One thing I guarantee to all my patients, even the athletes, we all age. When you age, disease comes fast. I call it the mountain. The mountain of disease, actually the mountain of death, will come. Now, hopefully you can postpone it, but for some of my patients that don't practice a healthy lifestyle, you're bringing it closer to you at a fast rate. And the bad thing is, nowadays with all this cool science that I just mentioned, you'll also have the science of life support. So with all medicines, pills, surgeries, you might have that mountain come close but with great science, we'll keep you alive. We'll keep you alive as a vegetable. And that, imagine that. You save up all your life for retirement. You don't exercise. You postpone all that stuff. You don't love. And then suddenly retirement comes and you're using all that money and investing all that time to take care of your medical expense. As doctors, we're not taught nutrition and we're really not taught mindfulness. So it really takes a doctor who has practiced that to teach you properly. If you can't get it from your doctor, then you have to seek out other ways. And there's a lot of great people out there, great sources. You just have to be on a journey to search for those connections.